In One Step From Eden, one of the primary gameplay mechanics is to move your character around the unique 4x4 grid. You are constantly adjusting your positioning to fire spells and more importantly, dodge attacks. To win battles without the enemy landing a single hit or evading complicated, seemingly impossible to dodge patterns comes from many hours of playing and learning the game. But is dodging really necessary to just straight up beat the game? Can you complete a run of this roguelike game standing perfectly still? For those of you who don't know, the objective of One Step From Eden is to travel from the edge of the world to Eden, a safeguarded city in a nation that's been ravaged by war. Along the way you gain new spells to add to your repertoire of attacks, find and buy artifacts that power up your character, and face enemies and bosses to stop you dead in your tracks. This game contains roguelike elements such as permadeath and picking up equipment as you go, meaning if you fail to complete the journey, you have to start again right from the beginning, losing any valuable spells or artifacts you gained along the way. Before starting any run in OSFE, you need to pick a character to play, but with 9 characters to choose from and with each of them having alternative loadouts, who would be my stallion to complete the challenge. I knew Reva Shield's loadout was the way to go for two reasons, survivability and attack range. The former is self-explanatory. If I can't dodge attacks, I need ways to tank all of the damage I'm going to take. Reva's unique weapon is the Reflector Gem, which, for the cost of 1 mana, nullifies any damage for a small period of time and throws the attack right back at the enemy. The second reason to pick Shield Reva was her attack range. When I started attempting runs of this challenge, it became quickly obvious to me that if my starting kit featured only attacks that fired right in front of me, it'd be impossible to progress if enemies refused to walk into me. If the starting kit had ways to attack multiple rows or panels, it would cut down on a lot of resets. Reva's spell Diagonal Beam covers 50% of the screen in the form of a snaking stream of quadrilaterals. This vastly outranges the other kits, which mostly fire in front of the character. I was able to get reasonably far in the first attempts given the restrictions, but I still had issues where I could never hit the enemy, forcing me to abandon the run. For example, a common treasure room that appears on the map. The top right Sarah pile needs to be destroyed in order to advance, but Reva, or any character really, can't take down the rock without moving, forcing me to quit. Another example that commonly came up was these beacon rooms where the hostage needed to be saved. Most of the scenarios evolved a turret that would be impossible to hit with Diagonal Beam or any other spell I happen to have on hand, and I'd have to retire. So since these runes had such a high chance of putting a stop to my run, it created a serious limiter on the potential paths I could take. So when I booted up another run and found this spell after the first battle, I knew I was in for a big run. I quickly set my focus drops to double flanks, increasing my chance of finding any shield spells, and already in the next fight, I pick up a pre-upgraded deck shield. So for 1 mana, I gain a temporary in-battle buff to my health equal to the amount of spells in my deck multiplied by 5. My next fight happens to be a hostage fight, and normally this would be a reset, but with Anubis in my deck, I can slowly poison each turret, although this means I unfortunately can't save the hostages in time. With Anubis, I now have complete freedom in how I route my path to the area's boss. In addition to finding the far-reaching air slosh and haven, another very efficient shield card, my deck was looking to be very formidable. And then, disaster struck. It's the fight before the boss. A manticore, ice launcher, and a missile set to hit everyone in the field in 30 seconds. My diagonal beam can't reach the ice launcher, an enemy that would never move. All I could hope for was that it would nick the manticore. My mana regen wasn't high enough for me to reflect every attack, but I tried to mitigate damage regardless, shielding and reflecting, shielding and reflecting. At this point, the missile is going to explode in maybe 6-7 uh, seconds. I won't be able to kill the monsters in time and stop the explosion. I have one fail safe strategy for this kind of situation. The explosion is actually reflectable, so if I time my reflector gem perfectly, I won't be damaged by the explosion and the monsters will die as well. I have one chance. 3, 2, 1. I failed to parry the missile, and now I'm down to half my health in the first zone. I still have to fight the boss. I advance the map, and I meet Violette, the magical musician, and possibly the hardest boss you can have at the start. If you played OSFE for yourself, you might think I'm crazy and on my rocker. Her regular attacks are easy to dodge, 
The speakers she throws onto your side of the field, while oppressive, don't fire fast enough to land a hit before they get blown up. And her signature attack, where you DDR your way to build up enough shield to survive the undodgeable swipe she throws at the end, is probably one of the easiest attacks to not get damaged by. But that attack is precisely why she's the hardest boss at the start. Remember, I can't move, and Violette wants you to move to catch the green squares exploding. So it means if she ever decides to perform the DDR attack, I eat 180 unavoidable damage. Thankfully, she decided not to do that, choosing to pelt me with easy to reflect laser beams. But I needed to take her down quick, before she decides to do more DDR attacks. She threw some speakers onto my side of the field, which is something I could actually use to my advantage. One of Air Slash's properties is that it pushes targets back. So if I push the speaker in front of me onto her side of the field, a neat little easter egg of Violet's fight. Her own speakers can hit her. Her health goes down from about 1300 to 364 before I accidentally destroy the last speaker, leaving me a bit worried but she moves right into my diagonal beam and I live for another day. With me the victor, I have her life in my hands. I could destroy Violette and gain extra spells and artifacts, or I could spare her, get healed, and she assists me in future battles. I choose the latter, for the health, and for another reason we'll see at the end. After sparing her, I move on to the first ruin zone. I get through relatively unscathed, and I also build my deck, gaining a spike traps, steel skin, blueberry jam artifact, and blue flame, a big pickup. For the cost of losing 1 maximum mana, I gain an extra 0.3 mana regen, which greatly increases my ability to reflect attacks and cycle through my defense oriented deck. And before I know it, I'm face to face with the next boss in my path, Terra. While not as scary as Violette, she still has some pretty tough attacks, such as her homing laser attack, or her low HP attack where she fires a stream of boss saws to your field. Still, my spike trap spell carried the fight, nicking her every time she teleported around her side of the field for easy exponential damage. By getting through the fight with only a couple of mistakes and lots of shield to take the brunt of the damage, the healing I got from Terra brought me back to near full HP. The blunders I made at the start of the run were completely erased. I decided to take on the fire zone, hoping to get Saffron as a boss, but instead I get them. I go through the zone without much trouble, gaining Ramjet, a Mana Vein, and the game taunts me by giving me rollerblades, a hard artifact to find that activates when I move. Now while Gunner fails to take a single hit point off me, I'm gonna explain why I wanted to fight Saffron instead of him right now. Bosses get stronger as you get closer and closer to Eden, meaning they get more health, they attack faster, and they deal more damage. Saffron especially changes as she does different kinds of attacks depending on what boss tier she's in. If I was fighting her now, she'd be in tier 2, which is a very manageable fight, even without being able to move. But now that I have to fight her later, she's going to be in at least tier 3, and that's when she gets especially tricky. Fighting Gunner at tier 2 is also a big problem, because ideally I'd have liked to fight him at the very end. He's not much of a challenge no matter what tier you fight him in. So because I got Gunner instead of Saffron, I have a much harder run ahead of me. I spare his life, although he only heals me for 30. That's okay, I'll explain it later. Now I get to fight Saffron but not before taking on the next fire zone. These old beamers take a toll on me because their laser attack also creates fire on the tile I'm standing on, and I can't keep my shield topped up enough to avoid the damage. On top of that, a Lux cannon takes some health on me because I fail to reflect the admittedly hard to reflect attack, but at the very least I find some nice spoils as I travel through the zone. I drop by the shop before meeting Saffron, and I happen to take a particular pack that I think will help me in the fight. Packs give you an instant reward at the cost of making the next few fights harder. The pact I took, Cell Location, teleports you whenever you cast a spell. Normally, this is very annoying, but when I can't move, this pack challenge is actually a bonus, as shown here. To be clear, using the arrow keys to move around the map was explicitly not allowed in this challenge. However, teleporting to other spaces with the Cell Location pack or spells like Shadow Shift or Blink was A-OK -okay in my book. Despite my attempt to incorporate dodging into the fight though, I still take a significant beating. And yet, 
The last three zones of the run don't happen to pose much of a challenge for me. The next boss, Hazel, only tickles me for 100 damage, because at this point I have too much shield for her to penetrate my actual health. Same with Shizo. I came into the fight with 701 HP and took him down with 5 HP more, because I healed while the fight was going on. I was worried about Celsi though, since she's a very tough boss to fight at tier 4, but while going through her ice zone, I find Infinity Beam, pre-upgraded to apply a frost stat 25% of the time. It was over. This run was good as done. By sparing the lives of all the bosses, you reach the pacifist ending, which has Terrible, the evil version of Terra, as the final boss. I melt her life down while reflecting all her attacks against me. I'm too big to fail. And there it is. That's how I made it to Eden without moving a single inch. But not surprisingly, I still felt a sense of dissatisfaction. It took me quite a few hours and uh, countless attempts to finally accomplish this run, but with the ease of the last three zones, I still had questions in my mind. Are there any other loadouts that can take on the challenge? Could I beat this challenge on harder difficulties or beat the game fighting a different final boss? Between editing this video and real life stuff, I actually managed to complete this challenge with two more loadouts. Default Saffron with her incredible HP pool of close to 2000 when you add up her second life and Reva assist, and Hazel's build loadout because of her ability to gain shield whenever she summons a structure. Maybe in the future I'll make a similar video for those runs, but until then you can watch the full run with myself providing commentary on Twitch. I'll be premiering these runs on my channel, the date and the link is in the description. And maybe after I'll try some runs fighting a different final boss or increasing the difficulty. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. And play one step from Eden if you haven't played it yet. Thank you for your time and I hope to see you on the next video.